Hello, and welcome to the Sound Health Network's webinar series. I'm Indra Viscontis, your host and moderator for today's event. The Sound Health Network is led by co-directors Julene Johnson and Charles Lim, who also composed our introductory music, and music therapist Sherry Robb and I round out the leadership team. Our mission is to promote research and public awareness about the impact of music on health and well-being. The Sound Health Network is a partnership of the National Endowment for the Arts with the University of California, San Francisco, in collaboration with the National Institutes of Health, the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, and Renee Fleming. This webinar series features interdisciplinary conversations between researchers and other stakeholders in our community, representing diverse perspectives and addressing obstacles that stand in the way of our mission. This month, we're exploring how music gets us moving and how it can help people with movement disorders, especially those with neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease. Joining me to talk about their work in this space are Michael Tao and Jessica Gron. Dr. Tao is a professor of music and neuroscience at the University of Toronto, where he is the director of the Music and Health Research Collaboratory. His research is focused on the neural and psychophysical basis of music and rhythm perception and the clinical application of music and rhythm to motor, speech, language, and cognitive training in neurologic disorders. He is the founder of the evidence-based treatment system of neurologic music therapy. And in addition to his groundbreaking work as a researcher and clinician, Dr. Tao is also an accomplished musician and violinist in the classical and folk genres. Welcome, Dr. Tao. And Dr. Gron runs the Music and Neuroscience Lab at the University of Western Ontario, where she is an associate professor at the Brain and Mind Institute and director of the Human Cognitive and Sensory Motor Core at BrainScan. She's worked with tech companies in the design of apps used to improve gait with music, among other interventions. And her research is centered on rhythm and movement, including how, it, how music might be used to help people with Parkinson's disease. And also, she's a concert pianist. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Gron. <laughs> It's great to have you both. So um, Jessica, I'm gonna start with you and ask you to take us through kind of how music and rhythm get us moving. What, what, what are the core ideas in terms of how it affects our brains? Sure. I think from a scientist perspective, we feel like, oh, we still have no idea. There's so many things that we have yet to answer and the movement system in the brain is indeed complex but there is a lot that we've learned in the last 20 or 30 years. And I think from my own perspective, where I came from was this idea of, okay, why is it that music makes us move? First thing you need to know is, well, what is it in the music that drives the movement, right? And that's not a brain question, that's a, that's a behavior question. And I think intuitively we all sort of know, the instrumentation doesn't really matter. Pitch is you know, peripherally important, but it's certainly not the most important thing. The, the type of, you know, okay, social is good, but a lot of the reason that social is good, particularly in Western culture is because we've developed these weird hangups about it. So is social really crucial? No, you can actually just be in your kitchen and all you need is a simple drum beat. And so the rhythm is really what we think is driving our response to movement from our response to music from a movement perspective. And so the rhythm, we know some things that, that are helpful it has to be culturally relevant to you. So there are many different types of rhythmic structures in the world and not all of us can perceive the structure in a rhythm as it's coming in from something that's not in our own culture. So it does need to be something where you can actually say, oh, okay, I can identify what the rhythm is here. Where's the repetition? How are these different onsets in time related to each other? And if you can do that, then certainly in Western music, one of the most salient features that tends to drive music is the beat. And that's just this equally spaced pulse that feels stronger in the music. And that strength we tend to mark with movement if we're not in a social situation where that feels inappropriate. 
And interestingly, when we look in the brain, and this is where a lot of my research started was, okay, well, what's going on when people just listen to rhythm? Obviously, if people are moving to rhythm, it makes sense you're gonna see the motor system respond. So that's not so surprising. But what about when they're simply listening and they actually don't need to even process the rhythm? It could be a completely passive task. What do we see then? And interestingly, if people are paying attention to the rhythm, you see most components of the movement system light up. So we have the premotor cortex on the cortical sides, the supplementary motor area in the middle, cerebellum in the back, basal ganglia is part of the motor core. Of course, we get auditory areas lighting up and they interact with these motor areas. And so those respond to any kind of rhythm. So even if it is a culturally unfamiliar rhythm or rhythm I have a hard time finding the regularity to, and in those rhythms, I might not actually move that much, but still my motor system is lighting up. But what we see is when that rhythm has a beat, when it is something I can move to, it's something I have this sense or this drive to, then some of these motor areas respond even more. And that's without ever making a movement at all. So it does seem to be there's strong evidence that the movement system is somehow really engaged by rhythm. So, you know, I, I think that um, this is a question for you, Michael, as a folk musician, it seems to me like moving to the rhythm is a big part of that experience. Um, that, you know, at least in my experience of folk music, it is designed to get people moving, you know, in, in these kinds of um, group events, et cetera. And I wonder if that was a clue for you that it might be used strategically for people who have trouble moving. Like, so my question for you is, how did your background in folk music influence the direction that your career took? Um, I think the uh, concept of rhythm is actually fundamental to all, all music. Yes. Mm -hmm. Folk music is really not special in that respect. Um, I mean, most of my life I actually spent as a classical violinist. And so the idea uh, to look at elements of music that can help in some kind of functional way people that have some neurotic dysfunction, for instance, movement as well. Uh, so I sort of went through my musician brain and my musician training and learning brain and said, what is the element that is holds things together architecturally in music? And that's also where you have to become very good musically, uh, architecturally, so to speak. And that's timing. That's that's sort of, as Jessica said, that's the rhythmic structure. And in most music we're talking about right now, is, is we're talking about metric structures, but I mean, they're non-metric rhythmic structures too. So, I, so I zeroed in on if there's anything in, in, in the musical structure that we can use maybe clinically. And I was sort of during my PhD when I was, uh, there was a music therapy component in my musicology degree. So I became interested in that. And I said, uh, God, let's try if we can turn the high performance model that I was sort of lived under in terms of rhythm rhythmic skills become sort of the core of becoming a good physician. Can we turn that paradigm around and help people who have deficits in a motor uh, control? Can we help them to relearn uh, to a more, a more adapted level? So that was sort of turning the paradigm around, coming out of my musicianship. Hmm. Uh, so purely, uh, can I help? therapy and music. Uh, so it has to be through the music. I mean, there are tons of other ideas floating around in music therapy. There's a, a big field of lots of different flowers. So, so I thought, um, if there's anything I can research well, would be the effect of rhythm on the motor system. And we uh, picked the most arrhythmic, consistently a anti arrhythmic movement in any movement disorder we could find, and that is the paretic walk of a stroke patient, the, the hemiparetic walk of a stroke patient. So you always have that long step with the healthy side and the short step with the weak side. So it's long, short, long, short. Or you can translate that, sonify that in the sound is like do, 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 do. So that's great. That's not great, but it gives us a model 
to test the sensory system, which is the auditory part, which is a metric cue for stepping versus the internally asymmetric stepping system of the injured brain on the stroke patient. So it's sort of the battle of uh, long short versus uh, even beats, okay? And so we didn't actually know what would come out of that. We had absolutely no idea if audit the auditory uh, system is so strongly connected and can actually drive motor neurons into a different kind of state, or is the injured brain sort of locked and harnessed so much into the pathology that you can do anything from the outside nothing will change. So we didn't really know. And uh, so we had a little NIH block grant that don't exist anymore. And so we tried and the uh, results were absolutely uh, extremely dramatic. We basically fell off our research chairs. And we saw how the, there was a large degree of symmetry immediate, almost immediately restored. So we, uh, and then the speed increased and the stability increased. So the effect was actually so stunning that we sh I showed that to our PR director about 20 years ago at Michigan, uh, at Colorado State, where I was a pro professor. And she sent it to him, Good Morning America. And they came with a big truck and filmed the whole thing because they didn't, uh, there was just, we, it, it was incredible. And uh, so there's, we didn't know exactly, and so the Jessica kind of pointed at that. We didn't know exactly why that happened. Uh, and so we spent a lot of time, not just now trying to run clinical trials to make sure this is really an effect that has meaning clinically, but we also spent a lot of time then in psychophysical and psychophysiological research to look at <clears throat> where is the connection that where the sound can harness the motor system. And the rhythm in music is a peculiar kind of phenomenon because it's cyclically and, re and repeated. And that it, then the timing harness becomes predictable and anticipatory. And anything we do, especially in motor control, we do better when we can plan and prepare ahead. Okay, so every athlete, athlete knows that. And actually a lot of things we do in the clinic with patients, uh, athletes do with sound and rhythm in their, in their sports training. Mm -hmm. And we had actually some interesting crossover publications and I actually consulted with the German rowing, rowing team for a while. So trying to make movement audible. So rhythmically. So in other words, there's, there's a, a multiple layers of physical, physiological and perceptual uh, connections between the auditory system and the motor system. So um, that's, that was the big battle between the motor system, <laughs> the epic battle between the motor system and the auditory system, who would win? And interestingly, the auditory system won. You know, it, it, may, it makes me wonder though, um, if, you know, how you take a tease apart just having a, a sound that is a beat, like a click track from something embedded in music. I, I wonder, you know, this could be a question for either one of you, if you have a sense that, you know, people just get bored of the click track. It's just not as motivating. You know, is it something more, or is there is there an additional layer, an, an add-on that music brings on beyond just a steady beat? Uh, well, the from our perspective, first of all, I don't really like to separate music and rhythm because rhythm is music, <laughs> even just a beat is. Music. Even if it's just a click track, yeah. okay. Well, a click, let's say a drum or something that sounds. Uh -huh. like has a little more overtones. Okay. <laughs> so the, uh, I mean, a lot of physiotherapists that don't have a lot of musical resources, they use metronomes. Mm. So the idea in adding other musical elements is they have to be added in a way that they enhance the sense of prediction and time. Mm -hmm. so you have a lot of random pitches and syncopations and stuff and you destroy the underlying rhythmic structure. But if you add uh, um, pitch and harmony elements in a way that enhance the sense of there's the next, there's the next beat, there's the next beat. Uh, so very rhythmically, comprehensively 
organized music, then music definitely adds the arrest of the elements adds strength to the perception of rhythm. The other thing is purely practical. Uh, the, we have developed training paradigms that are actually very successful in the clinic. So patients have to work, walk for two, three, four weeks. They're trained at home or at the clinic with sound, rhythm. Mm. And obviously listen to a metronome every day for two hours is not that pleasant. So there is a motivating factor too, that when you have music that you like and you're familiar with and you understand, then your motivation goes up and if motivation goes up, then guaranteed the therapy success is greater. So Jessica, one direction of your research that I've, I've watched in the last uh, little while is this, is this idea that not everyone has rhythm, <laughs> that there are pretty large individual differences. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that work and um, you know, how that might fit in and, and, and what music therapists in particular should be thinking about as they use music in their interventions. Sure. Well, first off, I'll say, I think the music therapist should probably be telling me what I should be thinking about in designing all of my studies. I would never presume to, to have the expertise that they do, but it is this conundrum, right? So there are a couple different ways of, of thinking about it. One is that, okay, as Michael said, prediction is key. And so rhythm and music that are perceived to be regular give you prediction that gives you a timing signal. And if something has gone wrong in your motor system that your timing signals aren't so accurate, we can scaffold that with some auditory stimulation that will, that will really help you. Um, and that makes a lot of sense intuitively. And we certainly see things like enhanced auditory motor coupling when people are listening to things that are regular compared to irregular. So it does suggest there's more communication going on between sound and motor areas when you have rhythm that's got a regular beat. Um, on the other hand, you have this complete dissociation where there are plenty of people who could not accurately synchronize a movement to a musical beat or even a metronome if their life depended on it. Yet that inability does not necessarily predict how much they desire to move to music. Hmm. So something is going wrong in the translation of the you know, predictive timing cue, but the music still makes them want to get up and dance. So this for me is a really interesting question where neuroscience can actually start to inform us about things. Cause often at times you don't need the neuroscience. Oftentimes, Behaviorally, if this works for you, that's all we need to know. We don't need to go about what's going on in the brain when that happens. We don't learn anymore, but we can spend a lot more money, but we don't necessarily learn anymore. <laughs> but this is when we're actually knowing what the systems are in the brain that work and how they may differ across people might actually produce something useful. So there are a couple of ideas out there. These are not necessarily mine. But various people have, have thought about this, including Michael. So one idea is that there's the pacing signal and maybe that works if you're, you have a deficient timing system, but this extra pacing signal really helps align things the way that it should. The other is what if you just love this music and it's a reward related response. And that, you know, we know for example, in Parkinson's disease, dopamine is depleted, but it's not depleted uniformly across the brain. And areas of the brain that are known to be involved in reward or release dopamine in response to reward, are not necessarily as depleted early on as some of the other areas. So that response may well be intact for them. So maybe for some patients, it really is about, oh, I love this, this really makes me want to dance. The other thing that we've seen is, although there are certain motor areas that seem to be more or less responsive based on how good at feeling the beat you are, many motor areas respond regardless of how good you are. So I do think there might be some separation between this enjoyment that we get from music and the drive to move to it and how accurately we actually synchronize. Now, it could just be that there's something going wrong in the translation that, okay, when I listen to regular rhythm, things reset in the brain rhythmically that are useful and, and are predictive, even if I can't then make a temporally accurate movement that you can observe, maybe there is some effect there. And I think a lot of these things um, remain to be seen. There's certainly some work that suggests, for example, with Parkinson's patients, those that have a harder time at beat perception may be less responsive to gate based or music based gate interventions, but it's certainly not the whole story. And so this is one thing we are really interested in is like, first of all, where do these individual differences in beat perception come from? Second, 
what does that mean about how the brains of those area of those uh, people are responding? And does that mean that there are different ways we can get into the motor system using the auditory system, but maybe via the reward network or via you know this pacing pacing uh, signal? So I think this is a really fun question that's still out there. Of okay, when it doesn't work, why doesn't it work? When this thing works, what systems are we relying on? Because we really, I would say. We have ideas about that, but we really don't know yet how to deal with this this spectrum. And you add a, a neurological disorder on top of that, and that's already incredibly variable on top of the normal variability that people have without any neurological disorder on top. So I think there is still a lot to explore in terms of optimizing or maximizing some of these therapies for different types of, of abilities. Yeah, we actually featured um, a, a paper and uh, um, by Gammon Earhart in our newsletter uh, that is a recent finding in which uh, uh, the, the group was finding that singing along mentally in some ways it can be more effective than passive listening when it comes to gait variability in people with Parkinson's disease. So essentially making sure that the way that their gait is, it doesn't stop and start the way that, that, that the disease ensures. And, and that I found that really interesting. And I wonder if either of you wanted to comment on um, maybe what makes sort of singing, you know, generating that beat yourself in your head by mentally singing um, potentially more effective in that clinical population than say passive listening? Well, uh, when you walk to a beat, you're not passively, passively listening because you're actually very actively engaging mm -hmm. uh, into the music. I mean, if you, uh, so <clears throat> there are a couple of things. One is, uh, in our clinical trials, we have never seen any relationship between somebody who's very musical and somebody is non-musical and doesn't respond to the mm -hmm. auditory stimulus. We have never seen that. So that has given us a lot of confidence that this is actually applicable as a treatment and not a talent-based treatment, which would be, that would be my life would have been wasted the last 25 years, <laughs> um, my research life. Uh, so actually the, uh, the uh, technique that we developed with ultra stimulation is actually adopted into the uh, clinical stroke care guidelines in the VA system and in the Department of Defense, which serves millions of movement disorders. And it's also adopted for all of Canada in uh, heart and stroke in the, in the guidelines. So it's been sort of established as a, as a treatment, which is good. The, other, the thing to understand is, especially in gait, that's, just a, little, that's a little easier to explain than in other upper extremity movements. So gait per se is rhythmically wired, is a biological rhythm. So we are not teaching, at least in my research, we're not teaching patients dance a tango and they can't get their feet together. I can't actually either, although I'm a musician. So uh, we are asking, we're trying to use the auditory system and music to restore what is intrinsically already rhythmically wired. So we're not trying to teach him a rhythm skill. We're trying to create a sensory harness, or well, some of my friends called it a prosthesis or something like that, that is actually restores what's already rhythmically wired. The only condition where I saw people not being able to actually walk to a approach walking to beat is a particular disease that we have done a little bit of research, not much, is hunting disease, which is sort of the sister disease of Parkinson. That's the only disease I've seen in 25 years, disorder, where that the application of music erosion was very, very limited. All the other conditions do respond well in our research. The other thing we have to think about is what do we mean by uh, synchronizing? Okay, there are different ways you can synchronize. As a musician, you know that well. You can try to march like a soldier to the beat. The heel has to hit on the beat. Uh, that's actually technically virtually impossible because there's so much fluctuation of even the well-trained soldiers, they can't do that. So the more important information uh, we get is from beat perception is actually the duration, the interval perception between the beats. So rhythm is really an interval perception of timing. And so you can synchronize to that timing interval in any form or shape you want. You can actually deliberately walk off the beat 
then you're perfectly synchronized because you're syncopated. syncopated. I mean, patients don't do that. But the fluctuation around the actual event is relatively um, uninteresting, let's say. There's lots of, it's like a thermostat. It goes up and down, up and down. But the idea of your setting a different time structure, constraint or harness, that goes into the brain with a lot of ease. So, so they adapt, even kids who don't have the well-perceived uh, so beat matching yet. So they're, but they still follow the tempo of the music perfectly. Okay. So there are several things you have to clinically take into, into consideration. We don't want to teach our patients with musical rhythm to now you know, walk like on an army base to music, okay? We want to stabilize the internal motor control. And there actually has to be fluctuation in there because they're also, this is why we have this model of weakly coupled oscillators. If they would be strongly coupled, a patient listen to the beat and they're walking to the wall because they can't stop. <laughs> so we need to be, the patient needs to be able to get out too and adapt. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> So that's so there is there are some differences. If you try to translate, if you try to use musical rhythm to simulate kinematic rhythms that are natural, natural, then I think you're on safe ground. Yeah. So this is I don't think this is fortunately not a skill-based or talent-based form of therapy. Quick word to music therapy. Um, why did we create neurologic music therapy? The interesting, we went to medical conferences with our results and we thought it would get blown out of the water because this was very, very new. And auditory system has nothing to do with motor control. That was sort of in the 90s. And it's like, doesn't work. So, but they replicated that stuff pretty quickly. A lot of people, especially the Parkinson's research, that was replicated many, many times quickly. And so they realized this is actually, this works. So the question came, not so much after presentations, the neurologists of the world didn't corner us in terms of your data, are, you question your data, say, no, your data are good. They're actually very good. We have just done a little study ourselves, it's fantastic. The question is who can do it? Mm. And that baffled me completely. That was uh, in the 2000s, I was like, what am I supposed to do now? But I said, the physiotherapists know everything about movement but they know nothing about um, music and rhythm. The music therapists do something completely different. Uh, so we created this sort of structured education system where we teach these music-based interventions, different techniques, and that we had to label differently to set it apart so there's some identity into that. And so we call it that neurologic music therapy, and that's been, uh, evidence-based and it's recognized, actually endorsed by the World Federation of Neuro Neurological Rehabilitation all over the world. So this is how I ended up uh, in the teaching business part-time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's a really important point because one of the focuses of the Sound Health Network this year is to really help the public and the people who are stakeholders in this space understand the differences between music interventions, music therapy, you know, the different kinds of, of sort of labels that we use to talk about um, these, these different ways of using music strategically. So I just want to kind of highlight that then that, you know, you, the certificate that you kind of created with your neurologic music therapy program is different from say, what a board certified music therapist education that they would receive. And I wonder if you could just elaborate on that a little bit more so that if people are interested in this particular way of using music, they understand where they can get the um, training to do so. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's, that's a very, very good question. And uh, so the, uh, the certificate is a four day course. It's not a degree, it's a continuing education program. And it's sort of, then now the Academy of Neurology and Music Therapy has a website that's easy to look, nntacademy.ca or co. And uh, <clears throat> so the idea is that neuro rehab professionals that are certified in their profession can legitimately do this continuing education course. 
So for music therapists all over the world, it would be, you have to be board certified somewhere in your country, Norway, US, China, all different. So you can't come in as a pianist and say, I can do this. Okay, so we want to make sure that people who do this, learn this as an added certified specialty actually have a legitimate neuro rehab background. So we have uh, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, uh, neuropsychologists, I mean, people uh, who are interested in music and we try to, we try to give them resource ideas how they can, if they're not, don't have 25 marimbas in their hospital, how can they use, especially through music technology, how can they build, build that into their treatment system? So you have to be, all the music therapists out in the US and Canada that come to the training have to be board certified. And then it's a continued education uh, specialty for them. So I just want to um, let those of you who are watching live know that if you are on uh, watching us through Zoom, you can ask a question in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, or if you are watching us via YouTube live, you can post your questions in the chat and um, we will pass them along to Jessica and Michael. So Jessica, listening to um, Michael talk about this intervention and thinking about the work that you've done with startup companies, um, do you see a way uh, in which technology might be used in the future um, to make this kind of an intervention accessible to people where there isn't a board certified, you know, neuro rehab specialist or, or someone like that nearby. Um, I'm especially thinking of, you know, countries where their health systems really are, are you know, much, much poorer and where people just don't have access. Um, and yet I'm sure we have a lot of people who are suffering with these kinds of um, neurologic disorders and for whom an inability to move can mean the difference between life and death. Yeah, that's, of course, the, the goal, right? Let's use technology for good instead of for bad. And as it's becoming more and more pervasive, it's already there. How can we take advantage of that fact? There are some things that make it a little trickier, which is that not all older adults adopt the latest tech. And that's always what, you know, an app developer wants, right? Like, oh, no, you need to update your system to this. I don't want to develop for a thing. That, so there are lots of weird practical things like that that, that come up. Um, but that's absolutely the hope. And so some of the work that I was doing um, a few years ago was just trying to get the basics of, okay, what can a phone do? And a phone is very sophisticated in terms of a lot of its motion capture um, abilities, except that in order to get really good, for example, gate data, it needs to be in a particular position where you're in a good position to say, okay, let's look at the you know, up and down movement, or let's look at the variability. And people don't want to wear their phones strapped to the back of their belt where it might be more ideal. They want to have it in their pocket. So a lot of it is about how you can make the data that you collect accurate or a proxy for something that you can validate in the lab, um, but not be too onerous. And I think this is where so many interventions fail that I mean, many people take this into account, but it's really easy to forget about if you're not a patient. For example, I was involved in a study once that was using um, a light beam attached to a walker that would project forward to help you know, people target where their next step should be. And the biggest problem that this intervention had was that people didn't like to use their walkers. So anything that was attached to the walker, which was a sign of, oh, I have, I'm different somehow and nobody likes to feel different, was not gonna work from the outset. And so that's where some of the benefits of these things that use existing tech could be so good. There's, there's no stigma to walking around with headphones in, in your ears right now. Like that's completely acceptable at any age or having your phone on you anyway. Like you've already adapted your purse to be large enough to fit the latest size model that you decided to have. So we don't have to get you to carry a separate big bag. Anyway, so a lot of it is right now these, these much more practical but important to solve hurdles. And then I think from the music tech side of it, you know, everyone wants to write the perfect pop song, right? So there's all this algorithmic analysis of music to try and give you more music you like, to sell you more music. Um, so what are your tastes and what are your preferences? And oh, have you tried listening to this one? And so that's really nice because it means that this is something basic researchers are interested in, you know, music information retrieval. What can we extract out of the musical signal to understand about the features that people will lock into? But that's also interesting to Spotify and, and other um, 
tech groups that have a little bit more money to throw at the problem. They have different goals, but the information that they're interested in is actually really relevant. Like, how can we find music that you like? And we know all sorts of things about beat rates and automatically extracting that. So I think there's a lot of promise um, that's not currently realized, but I, I think we will get there just because it's one of those natural partnerships, I think, in a way that some other times it's hard to engage industry on the question you're really interested in. But in this case, I think there actually is an, an alignment of a lot of interests that will produce things where we can say, okay, do you wanna assess here are the things we think might help your gate based on this profile of you that we've had you do through, through tests, a few tests in your phone. We can analyze your, your gate in real time on the phone through the app or upload the data potentially if we need to. Okay, based on that and how you responded to this, why don't you try this? Why don't you try this? Oh, here's a slightly faster version of that song. See what that does. And the nice thing about that is that often coming to an appointment is fatiguing for a patient. So if you can do things in the comfort of your own home, at your own pace, at your own time, there are also sort of medication timing effects that come into play, particularly in Parkinson's where, okay, have a look at what happens right after you take your medicine or when it's really starting to wear off. Whereas we only get snapshots of those in the lab and then that picture is, is the only data we get. Whereas the benefits of people being in their own homes in the real world and telling us real world feedback, I think is, is going to be really important in the future. You know, I, I'm sure they, they won't be replacing uh, therapists quite yet, but I think they will be able to reach uh, people for who, who don't have access to therapists or even enhanced therapy that, that's being done in person. And so, Michael, I wonder if you might talk a little bit about um, some of the things that you teach uh, your neurologic music therapy students that uh, can, cannot be replicated <laughs> uh, with technology or an app where the in-person um, you know, the, the dynamic there is, is most important. What are some of the features of the neurologic music therapy as you teach it um, that, that really require a one-to-one -on, one -one relationship between patient and therapist? Um, well, the only neuro neurologic music therapy teaching I do is in these 12-day courses. Right. So my PhD students, my postdocs say that's sort of music neuroscience so that I don't <laughs> teach them anything clinical outside of research that would translate would be translation um there are actually let me start from the other end i don't do that stuff but i've seen it and heard about it so if there's one good thing about covid it forced us to think or clinicians to think creatively and innovatively because you can't just hold your practice mm -hmm. so there's this emerging telemedicine and teletherapy uh, <clears throat> branched where it's like I've never heard of Zoom before in my life before I was forced to spend half my life on Zoom the last 18 months and, and but suddenly there are these enormous amounts of technology applications that work well I mean people sit they conduct a session with a client via laptop and cameras Okay. And the client sits there and they move to the music that the therapist provides on the other end, maybe a thousand miles away. Now you can't probably good get, you don't, you can't good, you cannot get good research data out of that. That would be very difficult, but you can still measure clinical outcomes. How many steps did the patient just take, which you compute that into velocities and those kinds of things. So there's actually a lot of things that can be done very creatively and much more than I thought. There mm -hmm. is obviously a point and, and some actually, since I'm in the management committee of the World Federation of Neo Rehab, I mean, the WFNR looks at countries like Ghana, Senegal, Philippines. I mean, they're not just looking at the US, Canada, where you have an office PT on that around the corner. Some of these people only get telemedicine. Only. That's the only thing they get of teletherapy. But obviously, there is a limitation in terms of the resources that are there on the other side. For instance, mapping movements, up, let's say arm movements on a musical instrument, which helps to control spatial targeting, spatial precision, and those kinds of things. But they don't have that. Okay, so there's, there are limit. there's some, you have to probably work on more 
on a very simplified version, which can also be very effective. Then, the, of course, there is always the interactive moment between, I mean, virtual is different. We are reacting and responding and motivating than if you can do this in person. Obviously, we, we, we are, we're trying to fake our way through that and say, it doesn't matter, Zoom is great. I'm not coming out of my house anymore. Uh, my whole social life is on Zoom. Uh, <laughs> but we, I think we realize that we are all brain dead by now. So there are obviously, even if you talk about movement disorders, there is a human component to that. Okay. And sometimes people also need physical assistance. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they need somebody needs to hold the gate guard or somebody needs to help them to keep the shoulder back so they have to be shoot open. So there are limitations to that. Uh, but it's better than nothing. What can be done, I have to say. The technology ideas, especially in music, because music technology is one of the most advanced technologies because musicians actually invented the first digital language. Really. So uh, especially music technology is, is really, really cool in that respect. Uh, <clears throat> We are uh, working on sort of sonification models quite a bit right now, which means we're trying to make comprehensive movement audible. So we have sensors on different parts of the body. And so when they move in certain direction, in certain elbow ranges or in certain trunk positions, then their movement becomes audible to them. And then the sounds should correct them or should enforce correct movement. Sports athletes do the same thing. It, you know, throwers have no idea when they should release the ball perfectly because they should release it at peak velocity, but they don't know where peak velocity is. So sometimes, you know, the gold medalist the next four years, three or four years there is like I'm number 20 in the world. So sensors here can measure exactly and give you a beep when your elbow is past the fastest curve and then you release the object. So their sonification is a wonderful idea to make movement audible. And it, enhance feedback for the body because in a lot of these disorders some of the proprioceptive feedback is unstable and making movement audible this also can be very motivating because you mm. get a sense of you're restricted in your movement but you make a little bit of a movement and technology can amplify that and you create a beautiful chord just by getting the elbow from 45 to 55 you can create a wonderful d major chord very motivating <laughs> And for kids, especially because, of course, then they become walking sounds and they love that. So there's a lot of things you can do, more than we ever thought. But obviously, there are, you have to use simplifications, especially when you talk about movement. Some of the cognitive music based interventions are actually easier to do than some of the movement based interventions. Mm -hmm. So we try to be resourceful, but I have to say, I'm really. Outside of my sonification research, I don't really research best practice of NMT in teletherapy. There are other people who do that. I'm Got doing it. the basic science of that. Yeah, you know, you're, you're, uh, um, the way you were talking about you know, having this kind of sonification of movement also makes me think of sort of the future of virtual reality and how you could once again amplify some of the movements and maybe give people a, another um, domain in which they can get feedback and, and, and how that might be used in the future. Yeah. If, you, if you integrate this with artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. you can actually, we got, fortunately, we got a grant last year from one of the Canadian Advanced Research Institutes to build sonification systems for Parkinson walking on an AI basis. Hmm. So that hopefully that machine learning will actually then learn with the patient to get better and better. Great. Well, that's the best. <laughs> so, uh, Dominique Lallemand has a question. Uh, she has two questions, actually. One is, uh, or they, I should say, I'm not sure um, if they go by she or he, um, but are there training programs geared to parents, grandparents, or caretakers who end up spending the most time um, with children and adults who have movement issues? Do, you, do either of you know of any... Um, you know, programs or, or, or training that caregivers can access that might help them use some of these interventions? I know um, yeah, some, of the, some of the Parkinson's, for example, the dance for Parkinson's and the Parkinson's choirs encourage participation for the caregivers as well. And so I think that mm -hmm. would be one way. It's probably not quite what this person is getting at, but it certainly gives 
the partner a a break and something to participate in themselves, but they also learn, okay, what are the moves we're doing and why are we doing them? What's, what's beneficial and helpful? And they can observe their partner receiving that therapy and, and, um, or participating in that activity and seeing the, the effects on them. And, and that's, that can be really nice. Cause one thing we found in a study we did of Parkinson's patients, about half of whom did participate in things like a Parkinson's choir and half who didn't do any particular um, Parkinson related um, activities was were they, were they aware of music ever having improved their symptoms? And whether they did any of these music-based things or not, the vast majority were not aware of any changes in their, in their symptoms as a result of this. But if you spoke to their caregivers and we didn't actually formally survey them, which now I of course wish we'd done, they often were able to observe shifts, you know, things that, that change. So I think participating is one way of doing that. Beyond that, I don't, I don't know of any, that's not, not my strength. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know either any formal program, except I know one program in Canada is called uh, Room 217. It's called, it's a, like a music care organization. I don't know if they deal with kids, but they train caregivers, uh, not therapists, they train people who care, but it may be only elderly. I don't know. The, the other thing, but it, it would be worth looking into that, definitely, if, if you're in Canada. The other thing that I think I can say is that, especially when you work with kids, uh, all, all NMT therapists will include the parent or the, or the caregiver in the session as much mm. as possible. Uh, there is also a, a, a very pragmatic effect because you want the kid to continue to work. The learning and training is the biggest neuro rehab principle that has been proven. One of the two big ones I have been really proven to be true. So you have to repeat stuff. You have to increase the intensity, not just every Monday from 10 to 11 on therapy. Mm. Uh, and so, especially with kids. So the idea to integrate the, the caregivers, the parents, the siblings is actually a very good neuro rehab principle because it will hopefully lead to more practice at home in different environments. Yeah, but that was a question I, that I... Them, I don't know. I, I follow for I'm sorry, I don't know. I would, uh, actually, it would be important to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it would be something that, that, that uh, would be very much useful. Um, I, I was going to ask uh, as well in terms of uh, these interventions where, you know, do we see, I mean, how strong is the effect... Um, outside of the actual moment in which the music is being used. So how does it transfer to, um, you know, other situations? Is it, you know, is it, how does the rehabilitation part work? Yeah, that's the, that was one of the biggest questions. When you discover an effect that could be therapeutic, the first question is, does it transfer? Mm -hmm. So the, obviously then all the clinical trials our entrainment trials where we studied the effect, of course, music was always present, but the, the clinical trials, all the testing and the long-term testing is without music. So you have to, we, we did a study like for four weeks, probably once a week for four weeks later, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, there, is trend, there is definite transfer. They work much, much better. The question is for long-term success is really, that's just a general recovery question, a rehab question, they need to continue to practice. So that's uh, the gold standard is not what therapy has the biggest effect really, uh, rather than what therapy can be transferred effectively in their daily life so they can actually practice. Mm -hmm. And we used to give all, all the clinical cl cl trial people, we always had in the grant a big chunk of money for buying, uh, well, back then it was Walkman, but it's a little different now. Um, yeah, I, think, I think this is one thing that has really not been very well studied, that people have attempted to do what they can. There are some studies for, you know, with Parkinson's, and Michael has done some also, that look at, okay, yeah, it drops off, but it's, it stays in to some degree, and that's useful to know, but you never get a chance to top it up. We don't. And then the other studies that I've seen, it just looks much more variable. And this is the thing where you need really big samples if you're going to overcome the variability, or you really need really big samples to explore the variability either way. And we, we don't really get the money these days yet to do this. This is hopefully what will be shifting as we move forward. 
But I think the, yeah. the most important message to your question is the music does not have to be present for them to walk better. The music can be an effective training stimulus. Yeah, I think that's an important note is that is that it is not seen as that something that is going to be a, a crutch that they're going to need to rely on always, um, but potentially something that can help them. Um, yeah. um, that was exactly one of the very first questions like 20, 15 years ago that neurologists, clinical neurologists asked. Mm -hmm. that actually, when you turn the music off, what happens? So, <laughs> so if, if the music, music and rhythm can be a very effective training stimulus to improve function. And actually a little anecdote that what goes back to something we talked about earlier in terms of the music in your head. You had a, uh, one, of, one of the study participants uh, in one of the first trials, he uh, walked around with his Walkman and he felt very secure, then shopping for the first time in years, went to the park and the batteries ran out. Mm. And he sang, he said, I sang myself home. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Well, music image, so, you know. Yeah. Very he, he learned. Yeah. Yeah. Said, I, I never forget that. It was like uh, many, many years ago. He said, Yeah, I just I panicked and then I sang myself home. <laughs> um, we have a question from A. Um, who asks whether a person has to have a certain level of movement, movement difficulty for the intervention to be helpful. And I think maybe the interpretation of that question there is at what point in the progression of a disease or a disorder or after stroke, do we see the biggest effects and, and, and where is this most helpful? Well, the earlier, the better. Mm. Uh, so post-acute, I mean, there is a soft brain phase in a very acute stage where any, any stimulus you do after three or four days of a major stroke makes things much worse. So it has to be a stable, there has to be some stabilization, but then uh, the sooner the better. And, uh, and so not all lesion types and, and, or, you know, will respond equally. Okay, subcortical strokes, cortical strokes, thick lesions, small lesions. Uh, gait seems to be fairly accessible in our experience because it's also very hardwired into the spinal cord. Sometimes arm function is much less hardwired, it's really not hardwired. So some, some paretic arms will not recover function, but, um, but some will. So this is uh, more of a, a variable clinical picture. Parkinson, I would say, in our experience, uh, up to one and year three, they respond really well, sometimes on level four, which is much more affected. There's still results, but then, I mean, it gets into also phases um, there, since it's a, it's a uh, neuropathology, it's a degenerative disease, so we can not re reverse it but we're trying to keep the level of function stretched out as well as possible. Yeah, I think the trick with all of these is that there's limited amounts that these can do. So we actually often see more benefits earlier. And sometimes those benefits are things that you might not observe as easily, but the, the uh, patient can feel it. So for example, if they find it easier to walk, maybe they aren't walking a lot faster or so, but but they're at that stage where, oh, I can feel like a freezing episode coming on. And that's the, the sort of the cognitive distraction from that happening. And this I know is going to help me get through it mm -hmm. where nobody noticed that they didn't freeze, <laughs> but they had this, this experience that was more smooth or felt easier. So sometimes you don't, you don't see it, but at the early stages in particular, there's less cognitive compensation, compensation required to achieve that movement when you've used this intervention. I see. So both of you are in Canada, um, though, uh, uh, Michael, at least I, I know that you spent some time in the States, if not, um, you know, we're here. And um, uh, so the question that a lot of people in the U.S. have is how do we get insurance to pay for these interventions? And um, that seems to be less of an issue in Canada, as you mentioned, um, if you have, you know, if you convince the government of Canada that this is effective, you're good to go. I wonder if either of you have any experience or thoughts about, um, you yeah. know, yeah. A little bit. So 
I helped out with some insurance cases as sort of an expert mm. in the type of insurance. I have a little bit of Springfield experience. Um, so in the US, uh, actually the, the three out of the five top ranks we have hospitals in the US, uh, Boston, Spalding, Craig in Denver, and uh, Memorial Hermann in Houston actually have NMT on the staff. Mm. Three out of five. So they have an NMT team, and then what's the name of this? Uh, the, the Congress lady that got shot in the head. Um, Gabby Giffords. Giffords. She, all her speech recovery was mm -hmm. done with, by NMTs doing melodic intonation therapy. Mm -hmm. So if you are in an acute inpatient setting, there is a, a bet charge. The insurance pays 3000 or 5000 a week for so 20 hours of therapy. What the hospital directors or directresses decide to use, uh, that could be NMT. And as I said, these three hospitals, three leading hospitals, they have PT, OT, SLT, of course, neuropsych, but they also have NMT. So how they have spent the bed charge money on salaries, that's up to the hospital. Yeah. So a patient, in inpatient can say, do you have NMT? Uh, I want NMT, I go to the hospital that has NMT, or would you consider hiring somebody? So that's not a problem. Uh, out, outpatient is the big US gamble. <laughs> and But I know that in many cases, um, since NFT has subcategories of techniques, like rhythmic auditory stimulation for movement and so on. I know that there are quite a few successful cases where uh, patients made a case with the insurance for, I want an NFT to train, retrain my walk, my gait after stroke. Mm -hmm. And then the insurance inevitably says, show me the data. And fortunately with stroke and also with Parkinson and Jessica has made lots of contributions there. The stroke and Parkinson's, we can actually provide pretty good evidence. So I've seen a lot of successful cases, but it's always on an individual basis. It's not, mm. because there's no universal system. Inpatients should always be covered. That's at least possible. If, we, if the hospital says, that's what we want, there's no problem. But outpatient is on a case basis. And so that's a mission of the Sound Health Network is to give people the information they need to take to their insurance companies and eventually convince the insurance companies that um, the evidence is there and there are evidence-based and backed interventions. Yeah. Um, and just uh, to back up a little bit, for those of you that were interested in sort of the um, the Dance for PD program that Jessica mentioned, that was uh, one program at least was initially founded by the Mark Morris Dance Group, um, but it's called Dance for PD. And uh, I believe the, the person who, who started it was David Leventhal, whom we spoke to a few months ago on a separate occasion. Um, so you can look for that information in our newsletter. I believe we, we also uh, profile Dance for PD. So that's all the time we have. Um, thank you so much, Jessica and Michael, uh, for telling us about your research and walking us through the way that music and rhythm can help us. Um, and if you are new to the Sound Health Network, you can learn more about us and take advantage of the resources we offer, including a clearinghouse that has lots of research publications laying out the evidence for the effectiveness of these kinds of music therapies at soundhealth.ucsf.edu. You can also engage with us through our social media accounts at soundhealthnet on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And you can watch archived video content, including this particular uh, webinar on our YouTube channel. Next month, uh, join us on October 6th for a live stream uh, conversation with Renee Fleming, Dan Levitin, and myself, where we'll talk about music during the COVID pandemic and how it can be used to help us heal. Thanks very much, uh, both of you and those of you that uh, were listening and see you next month. Thank you. Thank you.